My name is Melissa and I'm from San Diego originally. I went to film school in LA um, at USC and I'm currently living in Montana in the Flathead Valley and running a stop motion animation studio that is eco-conscious. So we are replacing the toxic and wasteful aspects of the industry with eco alternatives. It was my junior year of high school that I started realizing I really liked film. I had always liked art. And I was like realizing I'd go to the theater and I'd see every movie in the theater and I'd have no more movies to watch unless I started watching old movies. And I had some friends um, that were in my art class and we started making a stop motion animation together. And just on my parents' dining room table, I made the puppets. They were like little balloons out of clay. And we all kind of pitched in on a mini DV camera and just shot on like a basic tripod. Nothing was glued down. It was all just very... Um, archaic I guess and I just loved it I thought it was so fun I had a my friend who I did that with was going to film school the year before me he was a year ahead he went to Chapman and my family friend who was a few years older than me was already at LMU for film school so I had film kind of around me and I realized it was like a viable career path so that was when my junior year I started getting more serious about pursuing that. And my family friend told me about a program at Northwestern University called NHSI, the National High School Institute. And they had like theater and film and all these different um, camps you could go to over the summer. And I went to the film camp. So that was kind of my pre-college introduction to film. And I just loved it. I loved the people. And so I decided I was gonna apply to film school. So I applied to USC, NYU, Emerson, Chapman, and LMU. I think those were my top. And I got in everywhere but Chapman. And I, I guess there was an application mishap. But I think I believe that everything works out for a reason. So something went wrong with my application and I didn't get in there. So it was really just the other four. Um, and I got in everywhere else. So I was lucky I got to choose where I wanted to go. And um, I ended up having a not great plane flight going to visit the east coast schools so i was like i don't think i can do this every holiday every time i want to go home and see my parents so i ultimately decided to stay more locally and just a few hours from my parents and go to usc so yeah we don't realize like you're i was 17 years old we make these decisions about what we're going to do with our lives at 17 and we're barely an adult and it's just so strange, like looking back that I even had the the passion and foresight to realize that was the path I wanted, because I think that it's a lifelong journey discovering what you really want to do. And so for me, it was still, we'll talk about it. It was still a winding journey within film, but even to just really, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of really pursuing your passions and really using those as inklings of what you should do with your life. And that's not always going to be super clear cut in terms of, okay, I like film, I'm going to go to film school. But when you start looking at what you like to do and the skill sets you like to build, it can start to, you know, steer you in the right direction. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. Yeah, let, let's dive into that. So you, you accept to go to USC. And tell us a little bit about that experience. I was in cine uh, cinematic arts critical studies. So I didn't do film production. And that's funny because it was the only school I didn't get into for film production. Mm -hmm. And I just had this feeling like that was the school I wanted to go to for the college experience. So I just, I said, I didn't care. I would do film studies. You still learn, you're still taking production classes. And the funny thing for me was that it afforded me more freedom. So while all the production kids really had to hone in and make their certain films and have that path, you know, up to graduation with their thesis film or final project, um, I, you know, had my critical studies classes, which were fine. And um, I learned a lot in them. And then I had freedom to explore a lot of other avenues. So I still got production and um, I might be jumping the gun a little on our conversation, but I, my first, so actually, yes, yeah, talking about my freshman year, I tried a lot. I tried production design and art direction and all the artsy avenues I thought I would like, um, all the introductory ways you could be in film and nothing was sticking for me. I, I thought I was going to love production design, but it was like kind of 
a little less creative than I thought. And then I saw art direction and I art directed on a graduate level film. And I just was like running around with my head cut off, driving around, trying to like re-wicker chairs and get things from Target. And it was just so weird. And I was like, this isn't what I want to do either. So um, by the end of my freshman year and heading into sophomore year, I was like, wow, did I choose the wrong major? Like, I thought I loved film. I still love going to the theater and seeing films, but like, I'm not fitting in any of these categories of roles that you can do on a film set. And my sophomore year was when I took my first animation course, just an introductory course. And that was when I was like, okay, I think I've found my path. So in order to talk about how I got my first job, we'll have to go back to my junior year because that was really when I got serious about animation, but I also was very conflicted because I had an internship for a film producer and I really loved him and I really loved the job. I got the opportunity to like to assist him on a film during college. So I was interning and I was at school and I would go from set to school or I would go from school to set. And it was a really neat experience. That was Kevin Smith's film, Red State, and it was filmed in Los Angeles. So um, so I was lucky. I think Whittier was mostly where it was filmed at an old boy's prison. So it was like a little bit of a drive, but nothing someone who lives in Los Angeles can't handle, you know? So, um, so from there, I knew I really wanted to get into stop motion animation and I was taking a graduate level animation, pup, uh, stop motion puppet making course that they let me um, take. You, uh, undergraduates could just kind of get a, like a, a sign off to take a graduate level course. So that class was taught by Rachel Johnson and she went on to do, um, she was, she studied in Prague. She studied with like the uh, I forget what the studios were in Prague, but there's some really well-known stop motion animation studios there. And a few years ago, she did a film uh, that I actually interned on when she first started working on it um, that actually got a an honorable mention at the Oscars a few years ago. So anyway, so she was great because she was the one who told me, if you want to be in stop motion, start looking at internships because you can only learn so much in school. It's really about getting the hands-on experience on, you know, through studios. So she told me a few names. I reached out to everybody and I got, oh, we already have interns this year or, um, you know, sure, let's meet, but we're not ready for interns right now. And so I thought I wasn't going to get one. And I actually ran into her at the grocery store a few months later and she was like, try buddy systems. So I hadn't tried them yet. They were a small studio in Burbank. And I wrote to them, they said, sure, come in for an interview. And that was my first internship that I got, I believe my my summer, summer of my junior, after my junior year, so before my senior year. So my senior year, I had an internship for the film producer and an internship for stop motion. So that was kind of, I do feel that getting hands-on experience is really what led me down my career path. And it was, pretty much the only way that I was going to get the jobs I wanted. And I think otherwise I would have felt a little more lost than I did coming out of school. That's amazing. That's such a great journey and, and really big advice there for, for the audience is internships, right? Just get out there, leverage the fact that you're like, Hey, I'm in film school. I'm looking for an opportunity. What happened next? So uh, I proceeded to have a love affair with stop motion. It was just every time I would go, I think I went twice a week and I was learning directly from these guys. It was two guys who ran it, um, who were the founders of the studio, John Harvatine and Eric Towner. And then there were a few other guys that did animation and fabrication. And so I was able to learn directly under all of them, depending on the project and what they needed from me. And there were some other interns and other employees that would come and go, but I was very dedicated and just wanted to keep going and going and going. And so I interned for them through the end of college and same with the film producer, which was all, it, you know, it's, it, I was keeping my options open. My parents, when I would talk to them, they were kind of like, I think the film producer route would be more beneficial and you'd make more money and it's more secure and stop motion was kind of this very niche thing there weren't very many studios it wasn't even as big as it is today um 
I think now people know more what it is. Like, I think even when I was in high school going into college, a lot of people just didn't recognize that form of animation when they saw it. And there wasn't a lot coming out. Now you have, I mean, two huge films that just came out on Netflix, Wendell and Wild and Pinocchio, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. So it's really um, a burgeoning industry, I think. And, and I'm glad that I think for a while people thought maybe it would disappear or just be hard to get funding. And I really see this renaissance with it happening. And so it's very exciting. Um, I sidetracked. <laughs> um, so so I, I was uh, interning for them, learning a lot. And what happened is after I graduated, they weren't quite ready to hire me. And the producer wasn't quite ready to hire me. Mm -hmm. So I ended up getting like two more internships and I had like four internships for a few months. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was able to intern on a stop motion feature, which was fun. Um, and what ended up happening is that when I went to go work on that feature, I ended up getting hired on a two week project with Buddy Systems. And then I went back for two weeks to the other internship and then they finally hired me again for the last time. <laughs> and um, so it was, it was scary because I graduated, I went on a trip with my family and, you know, people are talking about the jobs they've already gotten when they, you know, when they graduated and everybody's, you know, kind of touting their accomplishments. And, and, uh, and I was like, wow, I, I don't have a job yet. This is scary. Like, I don't know, like, what I'm going to do. And so uh, that was ex incredibly rewarding. I actually got hired on my birthday. So it was a very special gift. And that was what really, uh, really kind of solidified stop motion for me. And, um, and so I was hired on for a very low rate on a small project. But in January, the studio merged with um, Stupid Monkey Studios, which is Seth Green and Matt Senreich's company, and they had Robot Chicken. So mm -hmm. when they merged, stupid buddy, they became stupid buddy and they got robot chicken. So I, they had big budgets and I was got to choose the department I wanted to go to. So everything really aligned for me. And so I guess some <laughs> words of advice or wisdom is just sometimes you have to trust that you're being led down the right path, even when it seems like things aren't working out for you. So Sometimes you just have to pivot a little bit and maybe take that other internship or take a job. If you have to bartend or do something else, like I think a lot of people think they'll just get stuck in that and won't be able to get out of it. But there's there's so many stories of even coworkers who have similar experiences to that. And it really is persistence in this in industry. And there's a lot of ways to break in. There's a lot of ways to stay in and a lot of ways to pivot. That's so beautiful. That's a really beautiful story. Thanks for sharing that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And absolutely. Just kind of like it manifested itself. You just needed some time for it to grow. Right. Man. And yeah, you got to be able to have that leap of faith, right? Particularly when you're trying to compare yourself with your other peers and where they're at. Right. And you never know. Opportunities change too. So someone who had the job right out of school, they, you know, that may be fizzled out in a year and then they had trouble and and so it really, one thing is really like um, just keeping your connections. I used to like hate the word networking and there'd be mixers you could go to. And I never knew why I was there and what I should talk about and who I should talk to. But I think for me, networking is really more about creating authentic relationships with people you admire, people you like. Um, and it's not like, oh, like I'm going to step on your back, scratch my back, scratch your back. It's just more genuinely caring about someone else's path, what they're doing with their life. Um and seeing how that might intersect with you down the line. And it might not be right away. I just heard from someone that I went to college with who's doing storyboards now. So that's a resource for my studio and he can get a job in the future because of it. And we already have a prior relationship. So um, it really, you just never know. You never know how things are gonna pan out and who's gonna end up being important in your life. So I always say like, just be nice to everyone and be open to everybody. and. Um, and just accepting like whatever their path is at the time, even if you think it's, you know, threatening or you think that uh, they have something that you wish you had because you just never know. Really well said. And so, okay, this now that this has transpired, you're, you know, you've got your first job out of college. What's next after that? How do, how do, how do you go from there to now opening up your own studio? 
Yeah. So I worked in, I uh, worked for Stupid Buddy mainly for many years. And what happens in stop motion, which I think happens in, you know, on many projects within the film industry is that you go on hiatus. So you have, you might have a job for six months, you might have a job for a year and a half, and then the project rolls off and you have to wait for the next one. And sometimes that's immediate and sometimes that's six months. So what I was finding is that as I, I loved it, it was my dream job. I was like, you had to pinch me every day. Like I was just so happy. I was in puppet department. My employee, my coworkers were amazing. Everybody at the studio was amazing. I was learning and creating every day. And then hiatus came. So you either go find another job or take a trip or, you know, you have to see how long will this be? So I started feeling very unstable in stop motion because uh, there's only so much work to go around. And if there's two big projects happening and then they both roll off, that's that many employees looking for work in the same mm. industry. So that's the tricky thing about the industry. The neat thing about it is that everybody works for everyone. So people who are working for my studio right now, they worked for Leica in Oregon. They've worked for Ardman in um, in Bristol, they've they've all worked in these, you know, some on feature films, some on TV shows. They've all have different experiences, and it's all the same amazing talent going into the projects. And I don't think that's common in the industry, other than stop motion. I think usually crews will kind of go together on different film projects or under different directors. Um, so this is unique because people really go where the work is, and so. It was about my second hiatus or third hiatus that I started feeling like I should probably try and figure out if this is actually a feasible thing to carry forward or if I should be looking at another job. And so what I ended up doing was um, going back to the film producer I interned for, and he was about to go do a, a film, produce a film in Boston. And so I, he said, he was like, I'm supposed to get a local assistant but if you know someone you can stay with in Boston, you can be my assistant. So I ended up calling my friend up from USC um, that I knew had family in Boston. And I ended up staying in a room at his aunt's place for a few months to work on the film. And another, another networking example, you just never know um, who the people you know, how they're going to be able to help you in the future. So so that was really neat because it was a really comfortable place to stay. And I had a kitchen and we would bake on the weekend. And it was just a nice, comfortable experience. Everyone else was staying in a hotel. So it just felt like I was living in Boston. So that film was American Hustle. And um, that was a really different experience than the ind independent Kevin Smith film I had worked on. So very, you know, fast pace, high stress. <laughs> everybody's very talented, um, very good at their job. So I, I got to see the inner workings of a film set. Um, but I have to say, after that project, I knew again, film wasn't, wasn't right for me, because it just the way I felt doing stop motion and the way I felt on the film set were just so drastically different. And I just didn't I it wasn't my path. And I knew that already. So it was just reinforcement that that wasn't so I went back to work once the hiatus was over back at Stupid Buddy. And um, this this kind of leads me into where I am today. I ended up slowly over the next year or two, just feeling creatively drained, a little confused because I could kind of see the roof of where I could grow in the company with, within fabrication. And if it wasn't within fabrication, then I had to consider switching to you know, more of the production side or another department. And I just started confusing myself. I didn't know what was the right path. I didn't know which direction to go. And so I ended up leaving because I felt like the work environment was getting unhealthy for me and I was tired and I just wasn't, I wasn't happy anymore. It wasn't my dream job anymore. And I didn't know why that was. Mm -hmm. So I needed to step away personally. I know some people would just stay in it and figure it out or maybe do another hiatus and try something different. And for me, it was about two or three times going back to work that I finally said, like, I think I need to step away and I don't know how long, but I, I need to do it. So I did. It was really scary. I started doing more freelance projects from home and I actually, my sister was starting a jewelry line. So I started working on 
that business with her very far outside the realm of what I would usually do. And so for about five years, I was out of the industry and I was doing other things. I did writing and writing, coaching, yoga. Um, I just, I did a bunch of different things. I kept building a bunch of different skills. And this is why I say, you never know, like to follow your inklings with, with what you want to learn, because you never know how they'll come together later. And you never know how they'll influence your path. And for me, that five-year period was really um, a coming back into myself and recognizing and kind of growing my life in other areas and not just my career, which I had always been very career oriented. I'm guessing a lot of people watching this are as well. So I think it's important to remember that career isn't everything. A job doesn't define you. That's not everything. And I really had like kind of an ego knockdown. I don't know what you'd call it, but mm -hmm. like deflation because no one was telling me how cool they thought my job was anymore. And I, you know, I kept going from odd job to odd job. And so for me, again, like, what do you define success as? I, you know, I got that job out of school. I was doing it for years. I was so happy until I wasn't. And so at what point are you successful? At what point is, is a job good enough or not and right for you or not? So that period really helped me. I, my sister was, um, dealing with some chronic illnesses. So we really started looking at the toxins in our home and just what's around us in the environment daily. And um, that health journey really informed my studio today because um, I realized how toxic my environment at work was. The glues we were using, the paints we were using, you know, in a room that has no natural lighting under fluorescent lights all day, long hours, you know, unhealthy food at lunch. There were just all these elements that are so normal for our modern society, for people to go to work and have their nine to five. And you just don't think about those aspects when you're in them. And so being able to step away and going on that journey with my sister, I really started to understand what true health was and understand like uh, why why at least part of why I had to step away part of what was no longer fulfilling me and um, working with who I was so that is that was a piece of the puzzle that clicked for me and the other piece was that by year five I was like I want to get back to stop motion but I'm not going back to Los Angeles so I had this conundrum of if I don't want to live in Los Angeles where all the studios and work are and I don't want to not do stop motion. The only way forward for me was have my own studio. So. Wow. That is very well said. Beautiful story. Do you have any projects that you're currently working on right now that you'd like to share? Yeah. So, um, so a little about the studio, just because some people might not really know what goes into the stop motion process. So a lot of what we do is reforming uh, as I said, fabrication is a huge one. So that is glues, paints, think about acrylic paint, think about um, epoxy putties, um, norm, uh, let's see, like, I mean, there's a JB Weld, there's Zap Glue, there's all these different glues, paints, clays that people use daily, and they don't even sometimes wear gloves or respirators or masks. And um, and that, that they're just breathing that in. And if you're in a room with 12 other people using all those things, all of you are breathing in everything. So someone's sanding epoxy, all those epoxy particles are now in the air and everybody's breathing it. So, uh, it was very important for me that all of our practices are eco, everything is non-toxic. And so there are a lot of limitations in my studio and, um, mm -hmm. It's been very interesting because the first couple projects I did alone, so it was really just me doing some experimenting and choosing ways to do the project that lent to the eco and natural methods and materials. And so this project, I have a couple in the works right now, and one is a big, a bigger project. It's a short film. It'll be about 10 minutes long. And that one is um, so far I've done a down shooter project, which is you have the camera mounted above and you have planes of glass below. I believe Walt Disney came up with this for 2D animation. So stop motion loves the down shooter. It's a very cheap and easy way to make really fun animations like with cutouts and different things. So that is a really easy way to animate, especially with the limitations that we're working within. But this short film 
is real puppets walking around and real sets. And so I've been working with some fabricators in Portland. They've been working remotely until my new space is ready locally. And um, so it's been fun because I'm having conversations with them and troubleshooting with them so that they're comfortable and able to move forward with the with what they're working on. So I have a painter right now who's getting used to these natural earth paints, which act differently than normal acrylic, but are still achieving what we need. And um, I've had fabricators who were working with things so that usually they'd use styrene or plastic, and now they're using papers and you know, natural glue. And I had one come back to me a couple months after they finished their working for me saying, I'm on this other project and I can use whatever I want, but I'm finding that I just want to use what I was using with you. So that was fun to hear because I think that, like I said, people in this industry, they work across studios. So the people working for me will work for places in Portland, they'll work for places in LA. So um, to have these practices disseminate into other studios is the ultimate goal. But again, it's just a lot of research and development into actually finding alternatives that work because otherwise the fabricator just wants to move forward with what they know works and get it done and get their paycheck. So, which is understandable because at the end of the day, it's job security. So my studio works at a slow pace. A lot of what we're doing is research and development. And um, that's very different. Um, some of what I'm paying fabricators for is literally just to see if something works. They might spend an entire day or week on something and it doesn't work. So I'm pretty hands-on still and do my own research and development, um, especially with my fabrication background, because sometimes what happens is I'll get a, no, that won't work. I, are, I know that won't work. It's not a good way to try. And I say, I know, but I think it will. Can we try it again? Or can you try it this way? And I get a, I don't know. I guess I'll try it. And a week later, oh, that worked. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes it's just really being persistent. And that's been a big theme for me is just having the persistence to keep going and trying new things and seeing what sticks, seeing what doesn't and not being deterred if something doesn't work out because it just means that wasn't the right direction. Try it, try a different way. Sounds like you're on you're on track to changing the industry. <laughs> I hope so. That's amazing. That's really beautiful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share. Is there any other thing that you would like to share before we close out our session? Um, well, personally for the studio, um, something I'm doing instead of internships is apprenticeships. And I really want to, instead of just having a more transient system where someone's getting credit in between classes or, you know, wants a few months of experience is to actually have someone come into the studio with a part-time job um, at a lower rate, but with the ability to grow into a role at the studio and be trained by people at the studio. So that's something I'm really excited about, kind of throwing back to the old ways of apprenticeships within, you know, craftsman industries. And um, so I guess if anybody listening to this is interested in stop motion and wants to live in Montana... <laughs> you can reach out.